The NFL Draft is tomorrow, and you all know how mock drafts work. This is my final one. This is my best guess on what is going to happen round one Thursday night. I'm not going to use a mock draft simulator because no free publicity from me. I made my own in this spreadsheet. And I see no reason why we can't just get started with number one. The Carolina Panthers are on the clock, and it really sounds like Bryce Young will be their selection. Young is the heavy betting favorite, and it's unwise to bet against Vegas when they're this confident in something. But to add a little intrigue, and although I think that it's more likely than not that the Panthers just have Bryce Young as QB1 on their board and have decided to take him, I do think that it is still possible that they trade down with the Texans. When the Panthers first traded up, there were reports that they liked a couple different guys and were open to trading down. Schefter recently said, I think the ship has sailed. I think that Bryce Young is going to be the number one overall pick, and Houston is not going to have a chance to take the guy I think they would have liked to have taken. So now they're sitting there at number two, and they don't know what to do, basically, is what he's saying. I think that this is a scenario where a smoke screen actually makes sense. They traded up to number one with a couple different guys in mind. They were open to trading down. They learned that Houston is kind of desperate for one of those guys, and now they've launched a full-scale smoke screen to convince Houston that they're going to take their guy and maybe extort Houston out of pick 12 or pick 33 to move up just one spot, and Carolina still takes Stroud, who was initially the guy who got hyped. I'm not saying it'll happen, but I could see a world where that's their plan. I do believe that is a real dynamic that is playing out at the top of the draft between Carolina and Houston. I'm just not sure Houston blinks. I'm not sure they pull the trigger on that trade. And if they don't, Carolina is probably happy to take Bryce Young first overall as reported. So that's probably the most likely scenario. And where would this leave Houston? Probably with taking CJ Stroud. I think that's the safest thing they can do if that is what indeed happens. There is not a lot of smoke connecting Stroud to Houston, and it's not a pick that you see often in mocks, but it's such a perfect fit. It should be obvious, I think. Bobby Slowick said, we're an offense built on precision. Everyone working together in unison, on time, in rhythm. That's the starting point. That's the offensive coordinator, and he is putting an emphasis on precision. Who is the best timing precision passer in this draft? It's CJ Stroud. Lance Zerline is a pretty prolific NFL draft analyst from the Houston area, and he tweeted that he has no idea where all the noise about Levis to Houston is coming from. I believe at one point Zerline said that there's like a 50 or 60% chance that Stroud lands in Houston, which means it could very easily not happen. But I think that this pairing has more of a chance than people give it credit for, and it wouldn't surprise me if on draft day... If Bryce Young is gone, Houston says, let's just put the most accurate passer in our Shanahan system and see what we can see what we can do. So then we've got Arizona on the clock and they could very easily trade out, but their roster is so bad, specifically their front seven. And there just aren't that many great players in this class. And I wonder if they don't just want to get on base because if they trade back with the Titans to like 11 or even farther back for whatever reason, there is no guarantee they get anybody good. And if they don't get anybody good, they are completely screwed. So I wonder if they don't just stay at three and take Will Anderson. And I know the most efficient way to build things out would be to trade back and take as many shots as you can on as many players as you can. But look, man, when your defensive line is MyJ Sanders, Cameron Thomas, Richard Lawrence, Lecky Fotu and Jonathan Ledbetter, I get taking the defensive rookie of the year favorite just to have someone to put on the posters outside the stadium. Like this team has Zaven Collins out there as a member of their big three displaying the new uniforms. Zaven Collins. If Arizona has a 7.0 grade on anybody, literally anybody that they think could be a pro bowler, I would totally get just staying still and adding that person to their team because they've got no one else who's going to make it. So after that, we've got Indianapolis, and this is where I cave to the betting market hype and draft Will Levis over Anthony Richardson for the Colts. The Colts don't have any good options to start currently on the roster. So whoever they take it for is going to be the guy day one. And I think they probably think Levis is more ready to be that guy than Anthony Richardson. And I don't even think that's a horrible take. 
Kentucky's offensive coordinator in 2022 was Rich Scangarello, and he has a lot of NFL experience, including stints with the 49ers and Shanahan, and that's a lot what this offense looked like. It was very pro style. Levis played in this offense and also didn't have much help around him, so he was constantly under pressure and trying to make things happen, which is the environment you've constantly got to thrive in in the league. So I almost wonder if they just think Levis is the guy to start right away, and it's as simple as that. Which brings us to Seattle, and I think if he was there, Seattle would take Richardson, even though they've got Geno and they just extended Geno. Because the only year that Geno is making real money is 2023. So if Richardson is better than Geno after 2023, they can just get rid of Geno. It won't be that hard. And if Richardson doesn't play in 2023, it's not a huge deal because he's super young and could probably use a year to learn anyway. There's a rumor that John Snyder loved Josh Allen in the 2018 draft and even offered Russell Wilson as a trade piece to move up to number one for him. They have met with Richardson. Apparently, it went super well, and there was kind of a chemistry there. For years, the Seahawks have wanted to add one of these super athletic projects to their roster, but they just haven't been bad enough to take them high. Now they're here at number five. They've got this opportunity. I think they would pull the trigger. And there are reasons to go in a different direction. Gino is pretty good on a cheap deal. Why not build a super team? But I'm just not sure they're close enough. They don't have a lot of depth at wide receiver. Their interior offensive line, I think, is pretty bad. The interior of their defensive line is definitely bad. I just don't know if they have the second corner or the linebacker, especially now that Jordan Brooks is hurt long term. Like, I just don't think they're winning a Super Bowl with this. I, I'm sorry. I think it would be better to draft someone who could open your window for a decade than try to go all in with this current skeleton. That brings us to the Detroit Lions, and I'm going to give them a bit of a surprise pick here. I'm going to slot in Tyree Wilson. The reason I'm giving them Wilson over a corner is because they've already spent money to bring in C.J. Gardner-Johnson and Cam Sutton and Emmanuel Mosley in the offseason, so maybe they feel comfortable with that room. ESPN draft analyst Matt Miller has said, I've heard they really like Tyree Wilson and have a high grade on him. Obviously, passing on Jalen Carter would be a big deal here, and it would kind of start the slide, I would say. But if the Lions have a very high grade on Tyree Wilson, which is not difficult to imagine, I could definitely see them taking Wilson over Carter and his red flags or over any of the corners when they've spent so much in free agency. Dan Campbell has outlined four rules for his players. One of those rules is keep your weight in check. And if Jalen Carter can't do that, he might just be off the board for Detroit. Now the Raiders are on the clock. They're in a bit of a tough spot here because they could really use a QB, but all the big names are gone. They could really use defensive help, but I don't think they can take Jalen Carter. I think he's off their board. I do not trust him in Las Vegas. I don't think the Raiders can, to put it bluntly, like they can't take another guy involved with a fatal reckless driving accident, you know? So I, I just don't think they'll take Carter. I think the most likely pick here is Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon. The reason that I think Gonzalez will ultimately go ahead of Witherspoon is the difference in athleticism. Now, Witherspoon did run a 40 that doesn't show here, and it was a pretty good 40 in the low 4.4s, but he is smaller. He's in the 10th percentile for weight. He doesn't have elite length. Meanwhile, Gonzalez is the ideal size for a corner, crushed the testing, and looks as fluid as anybody in the league on tape. So I think that NFL teams are going to prefer Gonzalez. I think that he's a more moldable piece of clay with a higher ceiling. And corner is a dire, dire need for the Raiders. Look, they ran man coverage 32% of the time last year, according to Sports Info Solutions. That was good for ninth in the league. You need a bunch of dudes if you're going to be running man that much. They don't have them. They were 24th in the league in EPA per man coverage call. They didn't run as much zone, but they were even worse at zone, 31st in the league. They could use a corner. <laughs> they could really use a corner. So a corner they shall have, which brings us to Atlanta. And I really love the fit of Peter Skaronsky in Atlanta. Atlanta's offensive line was quite good last year, but there is still room to upgrade the interior. And if you were to slot Skaronsky in at left guard and then move Hennessy to center, then you would really be cooking. Not only would there be no glaring weaknesses on the line, everybody on that unit would be kind of the same type of player. Jake Matthews, short arms, kind of undersized, but super athletic. Caleb McGarry, short arms, but very athletic. Chris Lindstrom, decent sized arms actually, but also very athletic. And then Matt Hennessy, short arms, but pretty athletic. 
The Falcons are willing to sacrifice length for quickness. I remember watching a talk from current TCU head coach, Sonny Dykes, and he was talking about how you always need to evaluate your linemen because linemen set the identity of the whole team. You should base your offense around the skill set of your lineman group. The Falcons understand this better than anyone. They have made it a point to collect small, quick, agile offensive linemen, and they have made it their whole identity. Running zone 91% of the time. That's first in the league. They're asking these guys to quickly explode off the line, cross a defender's face, and climb to the second level and seek out targets there. That is exactly Skaronsky's skill set, and it would fill their last weak spot on the line. If they took Skaronsky, I think they would feel like they had the perfect offensive line, the best in the league, because of what they want to do and how everyone fits that identity. The city of Chicago would go crazy if that happened, because that means Ryan Poles could trade down and still land the player he probably would have taken at one, Jalen Carter. I don't even feel like I need to explain this one. They so badly need a pass rusher, and this would make them look so smart. I think that his slide would end right here. Philadelphia doesn't have too many major needs. They can just kind of sit and take the best player available at 10, which is probably one of either Bijan Robinson or Devin Witherspoon. And I think they would take the corner over the running back. And I'm aware they made a bunch of moves at corner this offseason, retaining Darius Slay. They brought back James Bradbury for the immediate future. And they signed Greedy Williams to a one-year deal as well. But should any of that prevent the Eagles from taking Devon Witherspoon if they have a really high grade on him? And they should because he's quite good. Darius Slay is 32. I think that Witherspoon could be an elite slot corner because he's so good in run support. And is Avante Maddox upgradable? Yes. So Tennessee is on the clock now. I didn't have them trade up for a quarterback, but they still need a big splash on the offensive side of the ball because it is bleak and the biggest splash they can make without trading up for a quarterback is selecting Jackson Smith and Jigba. Tennessee has a glaring need at offensive line as well but I don't think any of these offensive linemen are nearly as good as Jackson Smith and Jigba and a single wide receiver can raise the ceiling of an offense much more than a single offensive tackle can. I think the perfect wide receiving core looks a bit like a basketball team, different body types to accomplish different things. I think you should have a a deep thread and a smaller shiftier slot guy and then a true X. And that's why I love the idea of pairing the reliable Jackson Smith and Jigba with the electric athlete in Traylon Burks. So now Houston is back up again. We already gave them Stroud at number two. At number 12, I'm going to go with a defender though. And that defender is going to be my edge three, Nolan Smith. This is kind of corny to say, but Nolan Smith seems to be a great leader, like a pretty special personality in the locker room that everybody loves. And I could totally see a new coaching staff wanting to add guys like that to the building to kind of set the culture going forward. Look at his teammates freak out after he ran the 40. And Smith isn't just some feel-good story. He is a real pass rusher with great get-off and insane bend. He didn't have total sack numbers at Georgia because no one at Georgia ever does because of the defense they run. But on a per snap basis, he was getting pressure better than anybody else in this class, basically. And his pass rush win rate was high and his sack per snap ratio was high. And he's super productive versus the run. PFF has graded him at an elite level in that area in the SEC in his career at Georgia. He sets a very strong edge. He doesn't miss tackles. He tracks guys down from all over the field. This guy's size means that probably won't all translate perfectly, but he is still an impact player to me and someone I'm very high on. If Houston had re-signed Akaranko, I'd probably mock them someone else here, but with him gone, I'm just not sure where the juice comes from. I think they kind of need to take a guy like Smith at some point. Might as well do it here. So next up, we've got Green Bay, who obviously swapped their pick with New York in the Rodgers trade. And I think that says something about who they may target. And I think they may target Darnell Wright. Crucially, Green Bay jumped the Patriots, who are starting old-ass Riley Reef at right tackle. And of course, they jumped the Jets, and their projected starter is Max Mitchell, who I actually liked a bit coming out of college, but let's be real, he is a late rounder coming off a torn ACL. He could definitely get replaced. And the Packers have brought him in for a top 30 visit, and that's not always a huge deal, but with the Packers, they do tend to take people they have met with. 
He is also the only top offensive lineman that they've met with. So there's a bunch of directions they could go here, but I think Wright is the most likely one. So Darnell Wright to Green Bay. And now I'm going to assign New England kind of a shocker. B. John Robinson. I think this is the point in the draft, somewhere around here, where a lot of the first round grades that every team has start to dry up and you get a bunch of those early second grades, borderline day one grades. And eventually, B. John Robinson, who's probably going to be player one, two, three on a lot of teams' boards, is going to really stand out like a sore thumb. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why on earth would the Patriots do that when they have a perfectly good starting running back in Ramondre Stevenson? And that's a valid question. And my answer is this. Bill Belichick is not afraid to try strange things and think outside of the box. If he thinks his best 11 players involves Ramondre Stevenson and B. John Robinson, he'll have them both on the field at the same time. In 2017, there was a stretch where they were lining up in 21 personnel, which is two backs out there, on a third of the plays. That was way more than anybody else in the league. He's not afraid to dial up some 21 personnel. It's especially easy to imagine a world where Ramondre Stevenson and B. John Robinson are on the field at the same time when B. John Robinson has a history of lining up in the slot and catching deep posts, okay? That is something Bill Belichick could be interested in utilizing. And who's to say Belichick is as happy with Ramondre Stevenson's performance as the starter as the general public is? The Patriots were 22nd in the league in rushing success rate. The easiest way to upgrade that, maybe, is to add someone who is top three on your board. I'm not sure that B. John Robinson is top three on the Patriots board, but when you look at this class, it's very, very possible. So I'm mocking him in the middle of the first. New England is the landing spot here. The Jets are on the clock. I think they take Paris Johnson Jr., which would create a new front in the Green Bay versus New York fan war over who won the Rodgers trade, which tackle turns out to be better will certainly be a random hot topic between two random fan bases for years to come. Dwayne Brown is nearing 40 years old. Mekhi Becton is always hurt. Max Mitchell, I've already been over. He was a late round pick who showed some promise, but then tore his ACL. I don't think they can be super confident in their tackle room right now. So they're getting a guy who is super athletic. He had a great pre-draft process and has a very high ceiling in the league. I don't feel like I have to explain this one too much. Uh, He also has experience playing right guard at Ohio State, so he could kick inside if he really needed to if someone were to go down. So yeah, I think it would be a solid pick. I, I don't think there's too much crazy about this that I have to justify. If that was a mundane pick, let me spice it up a bit. This might be stupid, but I'm giving Washington Hendon Hooker. I'm pulling the trigger. I know that publicly they're saying that they have confidence in Brissett and Sam Howell, but like they clearly had a fifth round grade on Sam Howell, considering they took him in the fifth round and all, and then didn't start him the entire year, even though the only people in his way were Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz. Sure, he looked fine in the one game he started, but Rivera has to know that he's on the brink of being out of the league. If this doesn't work, if they're bad, if he gets fired midseason, he's not becoming a head coach again. He's probably not even becoming a coordinator. He's just not a very inspiring hire. You've got a bunch of big names in draft media saying there are a bunch of teams with first round grades on Hendon Hooker. He will be a first round pick. His average selection placement in mock drafts these days is the 27th overall pick. That's the first round. A first round quarterback usually buys a coach and GM a little bit of time because you got to see if it works before they fire him. And with Hendon Hooker, you're buying yourself extra time potentially because he's not ready to play right away because of the injury. Now, I'm not saying the Hooker pick will be made completely out of self-preservation, but I am saying if they have a decent grade on Hooker, the self-preservation could be a hell of a perk that comes along with the pick. Getting into the second half of the draft with Pittsburgh, Joey Porter Jr. is still there. That's a common mock, but... I wonder if they don't go offense just because getting Pickett good is really the key. And I think they might take a a lineman for him in Broderick Jones. I'll kind of breeze by this one. It doesn't need much justification, but they've got Dan Moore playing left tackle, and that's not ideal. Uh, Broderick Jones is one of the few guys in this class with the upside to be one of the best left tackles in the league. He's not anywhere near that yet. He's very raw but it's possible and that's worth a shot in this draft. So now we got Detroit making their second pick of the first round and I think I'm going to give them another surprise pick with Zay Flowers. This take is less hot now than it was before half the Lions receiving room got suspended for gambling. 
And even if nothing happened to Jamison Williams, there's just no way they should be satisfied with Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison, Marvin Jones, and Brock Wright as their primary weapons. This can be upgraded in a big way. When they were on the road covering pro days, the CBS draft team mentioned that they heard that JSN and Flowers will be the first two wide receivers off the board. That coincides with my grade, and that's what's going on here. So now the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are on the clock, and I've got them taking Brian Branch. Look at this secondary, man. It is paper thin. Obviously, we all know Jamel Dean and Antoine Winfield Jr. and Carlton Davis, but are we sure anyone else under contract can play? These are the alignment snap counts for Antoine Winfield Jr. last season, and as you can see, he lined up a lot in the slot. He was their slot guy. He lined up there more than free safety or box safety or anywhere else. Winfield did a good job, but that's not going to be his role going forward. Bowles this offseason said, I don't want to move him around as much as I have. I'll try to leave him in one spot as best I can. I think I'll master that spot and get even better for us. So Winfield is probably moving to safety. He's going to be playing there. That leads a void at nickel. Enter Brian Branch, who, although he's listed as a safety, was basically just a slot corner during his time at Bama who lined up as a safety occasionally. He only had 25 free safety snaps last season. So if you're going back to the depth chart, move Antoine Winfield to free safety. Ryan Neal, who was a free agent, had a pretty good year for the Seahawks last year, moves to strong safety. Jamel Dean and Carlton Davis on the outside, and then Branch in the slot. There is not much depth there, but at least the starters look okay. So Branch goes to Tampa Bay, and then I think another defensive back goes off the board, Deontay Banks to Seattle. The Seahawks don't usually take corners high, but I wonder if they wouldn't make an exception for Banks, because with Banks and Woolen, they would have the most athletic corner duo in the entire league. Not only is Banks athletic, he kept a pretty clean sheet at Maryland per PFF Banks allowed 258 yards on 384 coverage snaps, and it's always good when you allow less yards than snaps that you're out there. Of course, at five, I had Seattle entering the Anthony Richardson sweepstakes instead of going with an edge rusher, and at this point, I don't think any of these edge rushers are A, nearly as good as Deontay Banks as a prospect, and B, scheme fits for Seattle at 20. Some Seahawks fans may be disappointed at the positional choice here because the pressure rate was below average last year. They were terrible defending the run. And in coverage, if you look at man and zone, they were okay, ranked 8th and 12th. But here's what I say to that. If you are great in coverage and you have two superstar corners on each side, there will be more time to get pressure and this number will go up. If you have great corners, you can devote more people to the box and the running numbers will get better. So just take the best defensive player available, fix some things with scheme, and you'd be cooking. All right, now it's time to piss off every Chargers fan by giving them Michigan defensive tackle, Mozzie Smith. Listen, I know you all want one of these wide receivers, but I grew up a Packer fan, and let me tell you, sometimes when you have a great quarterback, front offices say, our passing attack is fine. We can address that later and let's get some defense in round one. That might be especially true for the Chargers, who were the fifth worst team in the league defending plays on early downs because they couldn't stop the run again. Chargers fans may not want to hear it, but a 323-pound athletic ascending nose tackle with pass rushing upside might be very intriguing to them. Chargers Twitter would certainly be pissed at the pick, and to make matters worse for them, I think that will be followed up by a dynamic wide receiver, I think Baltimore will take Quentin Johnston. The Ravens just hired Todd Munkin to be their offensive coordinator, and what is his specialty? Wide receivers, wide receivers, wide receivers, wide receivers, wide receivers, wide receivers, came into the NFL, a wide receivers coach, Tampa Bay, wide receivers. I think that Todd Munkin had a really telling quote during his opening press conference. He basically said, I don't know why they hired me. Greg Roman was running a perfect offense for Lamar Jackson. And the answer to why they hired him is we don't want a running offense, even if it is perfect for Lamar Jackson. To win in the league, we need to throw. So your job is to make us a better team through the air. And I'm sure after they told him that, he looked at the depth chart and said, well, if you want to be a better passing team 
you need better receivers. And they were like, oh. So then they kind of overpaid for Odell Beckham. But Bateman and Beckham are not exactly always healthy. And if you're a team with a lot of confidence in your staff's ability to work with wide receivers, you might be willing to take a shot at Quentin Johnston, who is seen here. I don't think he's tracking this ball real well, which is a common criticism of him. But he is super dynamic. He is the best speed, weight, height guy in this class. I get the potential. I get taking a shot on him, especially if you have Todd Munkin on your staff. And he could be a crucial part to the New Look Ravens. Of course, the Vikings signed defensive coordinator Brian Flores this offseason, who is notorious for his cover zero blitzes. But those cover zero blitzes only work if you've got corners who can hold up and man coverage on the back end. And right now, that corner room, it's looking a little thin. Enter Joey Porter Jr., whose historically big wingspan helps him in press man coverage and would buy the pass rushers extra fractions of a second to get to the quarterback. It could be a perfect scheme fit, and him and Andrew Booth would give this secondary a very high ceiling, but also a very low floor. Jacksonville's on the clock now. I'm going to give him kind of a weird pick here. Will McDonald the fourth above some of the other big names. There are two situations the Jaguars are going to have to deal with when it comes to their edge rushers. The first one is actually losing Arden Key to the division rival Titans. And Arden Key was an absolutely fantastic rotational pass rusher for them last year. The other situation they have to deal with is the fact that Josh Allen is a free agent after this year. I think that Jaguars' Josh Allen has certainly played well enough to demand a huge contract on the open market, but he hasn't been quite productive enough to guarantee that that contract comes from the Jaguars. They might let him walk. Will McDonald might be the perfect solution because in the short term, he can be the Arden Key replacement. They're not that dissimilar. Arden Key is also kind of an undersized guy with a deep bag of pass rushing moves. McDonald really intrigues me because he was productive at Iowa State, even though I think he was being misused. He should be a stand-up wide nine rusher trying to flatten off the edge, but instead he was a hand in the dirt, five tech right off the shoulder of this offensive tackle or four tech or sometimes even three tech in between the tackle and the guard. And that's just not where he should be playing. And yet he still would dominate. He would still be able to bend the corner and, and get a bunch of sacks and pressures. I think he's got a chance to be even more productive in the NFL than he was in college because I think in the NFL, he'll be used more like an outside linebacker than a heavy defensive end type. And I think that's going to be good for him. In the short term, he's an Arden Key replacement. In the long term, he gives you an option if Josh Allen is demanding too much money. I like the pick a lot. I'm going to do another upset pick for the New York Giants. I'm going to give them Tennessee wide receiver Jalen Hyatt. Giants receivers caught a grand total of 11 passes that traveled more than 20 yards in the air. That is 32nd, dead last in the league. This team could not push the ball down the field one bit. As a GM, if you don't make Daniel Jones more dynamic downfield passer, this $160 million contract is going to be a black mark on your career. Grabbing Darren Waller to be a new receiving threat was a good move, but it's not going to fix their problem. Grabbing Jalen Hyatt, who was the most dynamic deep threat in all of college football last year, that might do it. After New York, we've got Dallas, and I'm going to give him the guy who has gotten plenty of Jason Witten comparisons over the course of this draft cycle, Michael Mayer. This one's pretty basic. Obviously, they lost Dalton Schultz to the Houston Texans. That's a big deal for a team that was top 10 in the league in 13 personnel last year, which means three tight ends out on the field. And they were also top 10 in 12 personnel, which means two tight ends on the field. So this is a team that needs a lot of tight ends. And I assume that's still going to be true even after Kellen Moore is gone. And I have heard that they like Mayer. And it's as simple as that. Continuing the little run of weapons here, I think that Buffalo would select Jordan Addison in this situation. I think the playoffs revealed that the Buffalo Bills didn't quite have the weapons to be an elite team. Dawson Knox was their leading receiver in the game they lost against the Bengals in which they scored 10 points. Their supposed breakout wide receiver two only had 34 yards. They had Cole Beasley playing an important part in a real-life playoff game in 2023. It was dire. Cole Beasley is gone now. Isaiah McKenzie is gone now. Jordan Addison is a great weapon from the slot. And the Bills met with him for a top 30 visit, and every single Bills first-round pick attends these top 30 visits. So this is important information. 
And let's keep going with the weapons. With the 28th pick in the 2023 NFL Draft, the Cincinnati Bengals might select Dalton Kincaid, tight end from Utah. Now, Kincaid has missed basically the entire pre-draft process because of a back injury he suffered at the end of the season, but it appears that he's cleared his physicals, and as Joe Goodberry notes here, the Bengals are not afraid to take players who do not participate in the pre-draft process and don't do the athletic testing. Only the Patriots have drafted more guys that didn't do athletic testing since 2015. Now, Kincaid is pretty skinny, and he's not a great blocker which could be a turnoff for a lot of teams, but I think it still makes sense for the Bengals to pick him because if I had Joe Burrow, I would be fine detaching everybody from the line, going in empty, and letting him play pseudo slot receiver like he's supposed to. Only the Chiefs and the Bills have a higher early down pass frequency than the Bengals do over the last two years, and this number might be rising for the Bengals now that Mixon's future is uncertain. And if they're going to be passing it that much, it doesn't really matter if Kincaid can block or not. Think Travis Kelsey. That guy never blocks. That's not true, but almost. With Jamar Chase and T. Higgins demanding the defense's full attention, a third weapon has a chance to really thrive. Tyler Boyd was great at that for a long time, but his contract is up after this year, and it's almost certain that he doesn't get re-signed. So Dalton Kincaid would be a good alternative to Boyd. I decided to give New Orleans Brian Brzee out of Clemson, mostly because I am just not sure who is getting interior pressure on this team. I don't think anyone can. And they can't take Cansey because their interior of the defensive line is just so bad that he'd be on the field all the time. And I think teams would just run at him and he has such a low floor as a run defender. Brzee was a pretty bad run defender in 2022 as well, but at least he projects to have a higher ceiling at that in the NFL because he's not an outlier in size. And 2022 was definitely an off year for him and he's been better in the past. A bunch of bad stuff happened to Brzee last year. He was coming off an ACL injury and didn't quite look like himself. Also, he got a kidney infection at some point last season and his sister died. So just a really tough year all around and he didn't quite look like himself. But he ran really well at the Combine. His tape has been better in previous years and he was the number one recruit coming out of high school. So he's still got all that untapped potential and maybe some team will take him in the first round. And I could see it being a chance the Saints kind of have to take. I mean, they're competing for the playoffs. This is no good. A guy like Brzee with potential and inside-out versatility is a fit. So Brzee goes, and then right after him goes his teammate Miles Murphy to the Philadelphia Eagles. It's been a minute since the Eagles have taken a pass rusher in the first two days of the draft. It didn't happen in 2022. It didn't really happen in 2021. I'm not counting defensive tackles. It didn't really happen in 2020. It didn't happen in 2019. It didn't happen in 2018. There, 2017, that's the last time it happened, and I think it's getting to be about that time. Brandon Graham was fantastic last year, but he's 35 years old, and he only has two years left on his deal. So this is the perfect time to phase in Murphy, who could use a little bit of work, that's the Murphy line, and phase out Graham, who's getting way old. I'm going to make this last explanation short because my computer is whirring and it's almost out of memory and battery and the fan makes it sound like it's about to explode. The Chiefs are the last pick in the first round. I'm giving them Anton Harrison simply because I think Anton Harrison might be the cleanest pass protector of all these first round tackles and the Chiefs, it's perfect. They drop back 500 times a season to pass. So why not take Anton Harrison and pair him with Jawan Taylor to replace the departed duo of Orlando Brown and Josh Wiley? There it is. That's the first round of the draft. That's how I see it playing out. 